Hello, welcome to Converging Dialogues. This is Xavier Bonilla. On this episode, I have Razib Khan. Razib is a geneticist, and he is absolutely brilliant um, about genetics, especially population genetics. And so, uh, we we this is a shorter episode. He's a very busy man, and we were able to kind of hit kind of these uh, really bright moments of um, population genetics and sort of some anthropology and just the study of humans. We start the conversation with a uh, overview of the basics of genetics, how it works, talk about the differences between DNA and genes. Um, he gives an example of the ability to sequence the whole genome in utero. It's a kind of personal example with that, which is pretty cool. He talks about how genes work over time. Um, we didn't talk about the different groups of humans as within a species and talking about humans as a subspecies from Neanderthal DNA and from other uh, types of uh, humans that were on, on the planet at the same time. We talk about modern day humans and how they spread around the world. We talk about the origins of Western hemisphere indigenous tribes. So, you know, how did, you know, indigenous tribes in North America, Mexico, Central America, South America, you know, how did they get here um, from the spread from Africa and Asia? We also talk about the unique significance, uh, the genetics of Genghis Khan, who's, you know, widely known that 10% or whatever of people come from Genghis Khan. And so we, he educates us, me and, and, and about the elements of how that happens and how that works genetically. We didn't talk about the population structures of India and their kind of caste system and how this works. And uh, it's deeply fascinating. It's very, very complex. Um, and then we talk about how to understand genetics with race and, you know, how, what are the differences with race and ethnicity? And, you know, as a pop population geneticist, he has a, you know, Razib has a different outlook on these things, which I think is super important and super helpful um, and when you, when you think about, uh, population variants or population groups, race and ethnicity start to seem more and more, um, irrelevant. Um, so it's a, this was a great conversation. Um, I totally would have him on at any point to give us, you know, even more explanation of some of the stuff I'm, um, grossly incompetent in the area of genetics. And so it's a, it was, I learned a lot in this conversation and he was just a funny, smart, engaging guy. So, um, I hope you enjoy the conversation. So now I bring you Razib Khan. I am here with Razib Khan. Razib, what's going on, man? Uh, nothing much. Everyone should subscribe to my Substack, Razib.substack.com. <laughs> Yes, go do that. It's awesome. Razib was prolific there with the last week or two of December. I mean, you were just spewing them out. Yeah. I mean, just post after post after post, and you got the podcast and everything. So, I got some, I got so. some good stuff. I'll be having Alina Chan on in the next couple of days. Yeah, so nice. Good nice. get. That's great. Yeah. Um, okay, just for listeners, tell people who you are, just kind of the brief rundown, what your background is. Um, Sure. What you're currently doing, what your expertise is in, what you study, what you like, that, that kind of stuff. So basically, uh, I am a geneticist. Um, I am a population geneticist. Uh, I work in the interface of genomics and uh, population genetics. So, uh, you know, evolutionary human genomics is one of my main fields. Uh, my background, I have undergraduate degrees in biochemistry and biology. Uh, I studied at the graduate level at UC Davis, advanced to candidacy. I left before I got my PhD. So I'm not a doctor. Just, yeah, put that mm. out there. People want to, you know. But uh, uh, so, yeah, like I, at Davis, I studied mostly mammalian evolutionary genomics. I uh, did cats and uh, donkey. But I also did a lot of consulting while I was in graduate school on human population genetics and ancestry inference. Um, I developed tools for Family Tree DNA, National Geographic, a few other companies. So I've mostly been working in that space. I also worked in Bark Vet, which is a canine uh, DNA. It's like 23 Me for dogs. Uh, so mm. uh, in terms of genetics, you know, um, I'm not a molecular guy. I'm a computational guy. That's what I do. Uh, I comment on population structure, population history. Uh, if you go to Razib.com, that has all of my various activities, uh, my various blogs, my various writings in diverse outlets such as Quillette, New York Times, 
uh, India Today, and um, you know my various podcasts, which like my primary one right now, Unsupervised Learning, is hosted at uh, my Substack, Razib.substack.com. Um, <laughs> but I have some, I have some <laughs> others too. Uh, if you go to Razib. Razib uh, dot com, you will see all the others. So um, I'm out there. I got a Twitter feed as well, Razib Khan. You know, mm-hmm. which I think we know each other mm-hmm. through that. Um, yeah. So my his my you're good on that. Yeah, my um, I think my primary interest, if I would say, is like, you know, it's always like population genetics and stuff like that. But then I'm interested in history, Chinese history, and I also like to do data analysis. Um, you know, like I work in R, Python, data structures, that sort of thing just a little social science question. So I would say like those are three things that I'm probably pretty well known for. So, you know, I wrote a op-ed for the New York Times about a canine or feline evolution once. And then the other one was about uh, anal- analyzing uh, data about opinions about abortion by gender stratification. So, uh, you know, that's what people want me want to hear from me. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so can you give us the, so I have a very elementary understanding of genetics, um, you know, definitely compared to you and maybe other folks. So just kind of give us the very, very, very broad cliff notes about genetics, and then you can kind of launch into um, just kind of the generalities of population genetics and go as specific as you want. Sure. So, I mean, genetics is basically inheritance, right? So it's like how the patterns of inheritance occur across uh, human populations or any populations. And um, it was invented, discovered, you know, conceptualized about 100 years ago, earlier by Mendel, but his ideas were forgotten and then rediscovered around 1900. And um, it basically mm-hmm. takes the intuition about inheritance, the theory of inheritance, which we have that pop- the humans blend together. They blend their, you know, seed with each other. And they, you know, Aristotle had, had some ideas, Darwin had some ideas, all those ideas were wrong. Uh, what genetics is, is it is a model of inheritance based on discrete, particulate information units. So a gene. So a human has about 19,000, I think now, 18, 19,000 discrete genes, right? And um, humans are not created by mixing the phenotypes, the morphology, the external appearance of uh, their parents. What, they, what they're created by is mixing their genes. And this is why offspring can look quite different from parents. And this is why there's a lot of variation. Mm-hmm. And it's also why when you mix populations together, you don't get a, just a uniform blend. Because that's not what's happening. What's mm. happening is the genes themselves are mixing and matching, and the genes express themselves as characteristics, right? And so, I mean, that's the basic Mendelian genetics where you have a law of independent assortment, a law of segregation. Assortment just means that, oh, the traits are not necessarily linked together. So, you know, there are people with curly hair and blonde hair and people with straight hair, and, you know, blonde hair, et cetera, et cetera. And a law of segregation, which basically is saying that you get like one copy from your parents, uh, from one parent mm-hmm. and then the other parent. This is obviously for you know sexually reproducing, diploid, blah blah blah. But in any case, um, so it's like you know um, siblings are on average fifty percent related, but they can only be they could be as little as thirty some percent related or as much as seventy some percent because there's variance around that, right? So genetics is about processes that occur from generation to generation that are also subject to randomness and stochasticity, and that's a lot of the work. Um, and understanding. Mm -hmm. And basically, you know, we have intuitions of inheritance that humans just develop naturally as part of, I think, probably you could have an evolutionary psychological explanation of it. There's folk biology, other things. But um, those are more empirical, and they're based on induction and outputs. Genetics was a theory that allowed one to deduce, which is what you want to do in science. It turns out to be correct. So we didn't have molecular Mm -hmm. understanding of genetic inheritance, Really, until the 1950s, when we discovered DNA, right? So, but genetic, yeah, does, yeah. I was gonna say, how does DNA fit into with the? the yeah, genes? so basically, the, the idea of a gene predates DNA by at least 50 years, and um, you know, it has to do with like recombination units with linked characteristics, et cetera, et cetera. So that's an abstraction; it's a conceptualization. And as you're exploring the material basis of genetic inheritance in terms of the DNA molecule, you see, oh, well, recombination is this. It's like DNA repair strand in this mechanistic synaptonial complex during, you know, Mm -hmm. meiosis two or whatever. Um, And so people started figuring out mapping the abstract concepts that they had inferred from inheritance patterns, assuming this model. that mm-hmm. actually maps to something real and concrete in the physical world. And so Mendel's law of independent assortment makes total sense when you think of the linear DNA genome, 
right? So why is it mm-hmm. that different characteristics are inherited separately or, you know, you can't predict one from the other? Well, they're very different parts of the genome. We now understand mm-hmm. why it's like that or like what is Mendel's law of segregation? Well, I mean, it's like you get one homologue from one parent and the other homologue, the other parent, everyone has two homologues, right? So you're just sampling out of one mm-hmm. of your two. I mean, we're, I'm using different okay. words now, um, but that's these words map onto molecular realities. We didn't know this as geneticists in 1900, mm-hmm. 1910, in the fly room in the 1920s. Uh, it was only, you know, really explored in detail. Like there was some stuff in cytology that was earlier, but in any case, DNA allowed you to get at the root cause the raw material of genetics, which is today the sequence, which took a long time. Mm-hmm. Took a century, right? Yeah. We didn't have the first human genome until 100 years after genetics emerged as a field. And in fact, in the 1980s, people were speculating whether it was impossible because we didn't mm-hmm. have like mm-hmm. automated sequencing. We didn't have polymerase chain reaction. So the field that I exist in now is dependent on huge technological uh, advancement, right? Yeah, so without the technological advancement, you couldn't be able to do much of those things. No, like you no. You couldn't do this in 1970. Nope, not at all. In 1970, you know, the molecular biological revolution of using genetic markers was focused on allozymes. And, you know, you could get like maybe like 10, 20 markers if you were really lucky. Um, mm-hmm. You know, when, uh, so L.L. Cavalli Forza, a human population genetics, that published the history of geography of human genes, this huge doorstop uh, of a book in 19, I think it's 94 now. Um, I read it front mm-hmm. to back when I was an undergrad. It's a great book, but, um, you could actually memorize every single genetic marker he used in that book because there were just so few, you know, there's a couple of hundred Mm -hmm. and that's Mm -hmm. what he used to create this huge book. And that was a lifetime's worth of work right now. Like in my computer right here, I have like, I don't know, probably like 20, 30,000 human genomes, not whole genomes, but genotypes, you know, with hundreds of thousands of markers. And I can run these analyses like within like an hour here, an hour there. It's, very fast. It's not like decades and decades. So we have at our fingertips an incredible amount of power. So I can, you know, for your listener, um, my my son, and you can Google this MIT Tech Review, Razib Khan. My my older son is the first child that was born who was sequenced before he was born in the history of the world. Yeah, yeah. I know you, you've yeah. talked about this before. You just kind of explained to us the kind of skinny version of that. Yeah. So what we did is we just took uh, some Coriani Villi uh, sampling, like placental tissue, um, when he was like four months in utero. And mm-hmm. yeah, four months, six, three months in utero. Anyway, but sequencing came mm-hmm. back when he was at four months. And so we, we took his tissue, we amplified it, um, and then we put it on a sequencing lane with a uh, Portuguese mushroom. And um, I just took, I just, you know, got, got his sequences out of there, out of the assembly, you know? And so people are like, mm-hmm. oh, are you scared? The genetic material was mixed with the mushroom. And I'm like, no, his genetic sequence is totally different than the mushroom. You know, so what you, what you do is like you have a reference sequence that you use to align the, you know, segments coming out. And it's just like right. my son's reference sequences are not going to be like confused with a mushroom, dude. You know what I'm saying? So, yeah, I'm, I'm chill. And also, like I mapped him out on the PCA. Like I wanted to like double mm-hmm. check that this was just like legit. And he's exactly between mm-hmm. South Asians and Europeans. So I was like, OK, it's <laughs> 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 the sanity check so it's so, so awesome it's so awesome um so okay so genes are the inherited it's what we get from our parents grandparents and all the way backwards yeah right and you know when you how with our genes and when we get inheritance how far back can we understand things well, I mean, about about well, i mean you guys know i mean maybe maybe you guys don't but with molecular phylogenetics and you know they talk about the last universal common ancestor of of all of all life, right? And so mm-hmm. there are some genes, there are some uh, molecular processes, I think like some of the cytochrome, cytochrome genes that are extremely conserved, which basically means they never change because if you break them, you change them, you mm-hmm. break them, and you know, they're just like essential molecular processes. And these are usually used to create the family trees of tree of life and stuff like that. Um, and yeah. so you can go back a billion years, right? Because those never change. They, they change very, yeah. very slowly, right? There are some, yeah. some changes. Now, there's other genes. Um, I don't know. Let's talk about like just like something in the neutral genome code, which has no function. Those genes, they just change according to random genetic drift. So they're basically constrained by the mutation rate. There's no functional constraint, which means that natural selection is not working on them. Well, those, you can't mm-hmm. go that far back because at some point, all the letters have, will have turned over. 
And so, like, the information yeah. signal ends. So, um, so you know, uh, you can go on those. You can go back, like, you know, millions of years, maybe tens of millions of years, depending on, like, you know, what the mutation rate and generation time and all these things are. You know, sure. but so um, my main focus is on the order of, like, tens of thousands to hundreds of thousands of years. I'm, I'm a microevolutionist. Um, I focus on microevolutionary mm-hmm. scales. So, basically, um, just, like, you know, Within the same species, humans. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So you never go outside to like primates or or other types of uh, uh, animals at all, or other mammals. Well, I mean, I worked in I worked in canine I, I worked in canine genomics and feline mm-hmm. genomics. So I have, but I don't I don't do compare. So I don't do comparative analysis. I don't do like, you know, like tradition. Like some phylogeneticists will say it's it's only phylogenetics if it's different species. And so mm-hmm. I don't call myself a phylogeneticist, right? Uh, because I never worked across different species, I work within different species. So I'm curious. I'm, I'm 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 curious about um, you know African versus someone from New Guinea. I'm not mm-hmm. curious about like a Siamang versus a gibbon. I mean, I am curious, <laughs> right. and I could I I could do right. that analysis, but that's right. a kind of a different type of analysis. Sure, sure, sure. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So so. Yeah, that's that's very helpful. Tell us about, I guess, in terms of what you do, mostly in terms of population. So, <clears throat> I still, I guess, a little bit of evolutionary tree stuff kind of here. First humans are where, in your opinion? I know there's some yeah. debate on this. It's pretty Let's pretty clear in there. Africa. I but I have a I have okay. to say, you know, the, the the word humans doing a lot of work. Um, I have a, I have a sure. very we Homo sapiens. Yeah, but even that. So the paleontologists they get to decide those terms. Geneticists do not. <laughs> Right. Okay. So now I think the last I checked, um, there's Homo Neanderthalus and Homo sapiens. So Neanderthals mm-hmm. and our lineage, um, Homo sapiens diverged 750,000, 800,000, maybe 900,000 years ago, somewhere in that range, right? Probably closer to 900. Mm-hmm. And so, mm-hmm. okay, um, that means by definition, if you restrict humans to Homo sapiens, it's got to be less than a million years. I have like a very broad definition where I think everybody who's Homo should be called human. Okay, so so I. What? Why? Why? Why not? I mean, they can interbreed. They can interbreed. Um, Neanderthals mm-hmm. can. It looks like they can do art. So we know that Neanderthals separated nine hundred thousand years ago. It looks like they can do art. It looks like they have some representational ability. They probably spoke. You know, um, mm. we interbred with them. We inter- We mated. We admixed with them. We have Neanderthal. All, right. Pretty much everybody has Neanderthal ancestry. You know, much more outside right. of Africa, but even in Africa, they have a little bit. So. Um, I don't know. I mean, the, the lay public often says, well, if they, if they can interbreed, they're the same species, which like there's a lot of ideas. There's a lot of actually, there's like a hundred or more than a hundred major species theories out there. So um, geneticists generally take a very instrumental view. They're not like phylogeneticists. So population geneticists are basically like, well, we'll just use the word species just in a useful way. We don't really care if there's like, I mean, we're not, most of us are not religious. We don't think that God created like 450,000 species. You know what right. I'm saying? The species is just like okay, it's just tips of the tips of the nodes uh, of the tree of life, mm-hmm. right? And so um, I say that humans, Homo, I mean, yeah, like they look a bit different. Um, you know, they're shaped a bit different, but I mean, you'd recognize them as human. I mean, honestly, you look at a chimpanzee and it's like kind of creepy. You know, you know what I'm saying? It's just like <laughs> I definitely feel that way with bonobos because yeah. they have like the same they, kind of, like, yeah, gait exactly. when they yeah, stand yeah. and. It's like this, yeah, like yeah. weird, so ima- like, imagine like some, primordial version. Imagine of Imagine something <laughs> that's like three times closer to you. So some sort of like Homo yeah, habilis descendant, right? Like that would freak you mm-hmm. out even more, right? Yeah, that'd be yeah. weird. Yeah. <laughs> so is it kind of a myth? I think it was uh, uh, Hirari that was doing the whole thing, where it's like there's four different types of humans on the planet at the same time. There was like um, uh, Homo it's sapiens. Not, it's not a myth. It's just how you want to define it. Okay. Yeah. Better. Yeah. It's how how are we trying to like have the categorization yeah. of things? I mean, and, right? and it's more than four, probably. It looks mm-hmm. like but it's at least that that's the categories. Four. But they would say it's yeah. More there's probably than more. That. There's a lot of like weird little critters out there that we absorbed or ate or whatever. I don't know what we did, but um, it, we're in a we're mm-hmm. we're in a weird position right now where there's like one primary lineage left. For most for mm-hmm. most of the. Uh, of the last, you know, couple of million years, uh, for most of the Pleistocene, for example, our lineage uh, hominins was much more speciose, as they would say, right? Mm-hmm. 
So there was like multiple different types of species or lineages or groups of these humans. And now there's only one. So that's weird. Is there, I mean, I'm sure there is hypotheses for why? It's because God willed it. (laughs) No, um, seriously, the the main hypothesis is that like, we're just like a super species. You know, we're just Hmm. awesome. Homo sapiens, like, like the, the theory like 10, 20 years ago would be we killed them all. You know, but Mm -hmm. now it looks like we have Neanderthal Mm -hmm. DNA, we have Denisovan DNA in Africa. There's probably other types of things going on. So it could be that Mm -hmm. we just absorb them genetically, that we just like exploded Mm -hmm. demographically, like something happened X amount of time and there was Mm -hmm. a massive demographic wave. And maybe we'll re, I mean, you know, if if, if we were still hunter gatherers, we would probably re speciate at some point. Hmm. You know what I'm saying? Like, like all, all you need for speciation is isolation. Like, that's not going to happen too much today because there's just too much gene flow because of modern transportation. But if we were just hunter-gatherers, it's feasible that we could have re-speciated again, you know? Hmm. So it's it's very unlikely at this point that that would happen again. Your civilization might collapse. You know, but what you you (laughs) need is... So basically, if we get off planet, it might happen again. So... Hmm. Basically, um, the rule of thumb, and it's, it's true, it's not just rule of thumb, there's some theoretical reasons. For two different populations, you need one migrant every generation to prevent them from diverging. Hmm. That's all. You need one. If it's below hmm. one, they start diverging. So imagine like there's people living on Ganymede and people mm-hmm. living on Earth. Mm-hmm. And there's less, you know, every other generation, someone goes between the two. They would start to speciate. Mm-hmm. Why? It's so interesting. Well, just because genetic drift, what happens is um, it's just you, you're random walking through space, and eventually you start to develop genetic, genetic in- incompatibilities. Because when you mix mm. across lineages and you mix like between people, there's natural selection that's happening on the immune system of immune incompatibilities. Right. This is this is a particularly mammalian mm-hmm. feature. What happens when you have mm-hmm. separate mm-hmm. lineages is eventually the miscarriage rate starts to get really high. There's already Mm. evidence that Neanderthals and and our modern lineage were not totally compatible. They're mostly compatible, but there is some genetic Mm. evidence that there was some selection of Neanderthal genes in our genomes um, to be Mm. to to like kind of get them out of there because they're not totally compatible. And so um, Mm. when you have separation, the populations naturally start drifting off into different directions. But if you have one individual Mm. going between, then it prevents that. Yeah. Oh, that's, I never knew that. That's it's, really an, it's, a, it's an obscure it's a, conservation genetic fact, but yeah, it's super interesting. It, with this, um, the kind of this supercharged humans that we are, I guess in, in, now, what are the mixes that we have? Is it just a mixture of all the like, you know, the main four or, or other types of species? As far as we know, genetically, what are, what are the? Well, because we know we everybody's got. We know that like everybody in the eastern half of Asia and to a large extent Papua New Guinea and Australia, to a much larger extent, have Denise of it which is a sister lineage mm-hmm. with Neanderthals, right? And so mm-hmm. one thing with Denisovans is that we're finding out is it looks like Neanderthals were one boring lineage. Denisovans were multiple different lineages, like deeply diverged mm-hmm. themselves. So the difference between two Denisovans could have been greater, I mean, was greater than the difference between uh, Khoisan, uh, Bushman, and say mm-hmm. someone from Alaska. They're really, mm. really different. Denisovans had a lot of internal structure, a lot of racial variation. Uh, but in any case, everybody in the eastern half of Eurasia seems to have some Denisovan, as well as like people in the New World, a little bit, not too much. In Papua, it's as much as 5%, which is a fair amount. Yeah, wow. Papua, like the Oceanian people have 5%. They might have gotten multiple Denisovan admixtures. Um, so mm. multiple Denisovan populations were absorbed into them. Um, so Neanderthal, everybody outside of Africa is about like, two low twos like 1.8 1.9 to like low twos low two percent right Mm -hmm. neanderthal um and then in africa itself it's a little bit more complicated because we don't have ancient genomes but probably at least a couple of percent of something that's really really different from the modern human lineage which is uh very distinct from everything else or not very distinct but Mm -hmm. it's it's basically like okay like this one lineage blew up and expanded and absorbed Mm -hmm. everything else so yeah i mean hari's uh his general his general framework is correct. The details I would probably quibble with, but hey, that's because it's science. <laughs> sure, yeah. So when do we get to just us? Just the one? Uh, Where does that happen? Between, probably between 30 and 40,000 years ago. It depends. I th- 
I, the latest work on the Flores Hobbits is really confusing, but I think now they think it's much older that they went extinct, like right when modern humans showed up. So mm-hmm. it used to be like, oh, they lived like till 10,000 years ago, but that was a dating problem. So it's probably mm-hmm. probably like around like 35,000 years ago, I'm confident to say. It's mostly us plus what we absorbed. Okay? Mm-hmm. But mm-hmm. Neanderthals were definitely around until 40,000 years ago. Uh, that's when like Neanderthals mm-hmm. and humans contacted in Europe. Um, and in Africa... There probably could have been. Um, I know for a fact that Lee Berger thinks Homo naledi lasted pretty late in South mm-hmm. Africa. And um, there's weird stuff in Southeast Asia that we're only getting a handle on now. Denisovans probably, I mean, Denisovans could have lasted the latest 20,000 years ago, depending on some of the genetics. But it could be, it was like, it, it could be what happened with Papua is like, there was a 20% Tanisiban population that mixed 40,000 years ago. And then at 20,000 years ago, that population mixed with the ancestors of Papua New Guineans, right? And so they got mm-hmm. diluted. Yeah. They're 20%, of, you mm-hmm. know, and so, and, and so like that, this, it, it can be a little complicated that way. But yeah, 40, 000, 40, 35, 40,000 years ago, that's when we became the only species. But if you go earlier than 50,000 years ago, it's all over the place. So it was like a really narrow window of time when we exploded. Our ancestors exploded. So just backing up real quick for a minute, primates in terms of, you know, we're, we're all common ancestor with African primates. Yeah. And, and then you have all these different types of the homo class. When do they start spreading out around the, the yeah. planet? As, well, is, and of course the planet's shifting and changing as well. Yeah. yeah. But how, how is, how does that happen? So yeah, it's mostly African, but there was actually like a lot of, um, apes in europe and in asia like orangutans are not it's not a coincidence and so there's actually yeah, movement yeah, yeah. back and forth and there's arguments about like what the earliest proto-human you know we don't actually they don't know that well okay like they're never going to get dna probably out of these things they might get some proteins at some point but that's just, that's a different a different issue um so n- we don't know for sure but like you know it looks like by about six million years ago we separated from the ancestors of the common chimpanzee and the bonobo Right. So mm-hmm. we're in Africa then, but there is some evidence that we could be descended from an Asian ape that went back into Africa earlier. And then mm-hmm. there's some evidence that at the end of the Cretaceous, the KT event, that actually the ape lineages started in what is now Europe. It looked a little different because mm-hmm. the 60 million years is a long time, 66 million years is a long time. Um, so that gets complicated. And, you know, the restriction of apes to Southeast Asia and Africa is actually like relatively recent insofar as like apes used to be a pretty big deal. It used to be a really specious lineage, but then like monkeys went wild. So apes used to occupy the monkey lineage um, uh, ecological niche, but then monkeys Mm -hmm. ended up doing a better job being apes than apes. And so the Mm -hmm. apes that are left are like the last lineages that have like very different um, ecological niches than monkeys. Because monkeys are just better at doing monkey stuff. Yeah. <laughs> right. Okay. So, well, the reason I ask is because now we have, you know, the modern humans, right? So let's say, you know, 30, 35,000 years. And up until now, now we have, when we get to all the way how, ways of how people move around on the planet, right? So you have people that come from Africa, but then you're saying that they're in Oceania, they're in certain parts of Europe. And then, so when you start talking about um, humans in certain places, right? And then when you get all, all the way up to mm-hmm. current day where people start talking about race and ethnicity and all these things and first peoples and indigenous peoples and all these things, you know, how that's kind of where my mindset is going. How do you understand some of this stuff? Um, you know, like, the way I understand it is different than how a lot of people understand it just because you know, everything, we're just reducing genetic genealogies to these narratives. Like, the narratives are, like, poor fits mm-hmm. to a genetic genealogy, right? Um, and so, like, I think of it as a graph. Like, people used to see the family tree, but it turns out there's so much admixture. So you think of this as graph going back into time, and there's genes just scrambling back and forth to different distributions, you know? I mean, so that, that's how I understand it. Um, you know, modern humans have had a range expansion over the last 50,000 years, occupied different parts of the world, replaced each other, admixed with each other. Um, it's a lot more complicated than we thought like 10, 20 years ago because we have ancient DNA and the ancient DNA. Too. Like, for example, um, the first modern humans to arrive in Europe left no descendants. Really? They just didn't procreate? No, 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 no. Like they, they, they procreated. 
probably they're probably they're probably okay. it. No, I don't, I don't know. I don't know what happened. But they didn't leave. We have their DNA. We have their DNA. Huh. Um, there's a site called Aussi in uh, Romania. It's like dates to like thirty nine thousand years ago. Uh, we have their DNA, and like these are like you know Cro-Magnon is what we would call them. I think they're like Aragnatian or something. I'm not good with pronunciation, so call me out that. But um, in any case, so they looked at their DNA and they're like, oh, they're genetically equal distance to every single person outside of Africa, which mean and that basically means they don't contribute any genes to any modern Europeans. So the earliest date that that there are genes from from like these Pleistocene hunter gatherers in modern Europeans is like maybe like. 34,000, 35,000 years ago. Um, I think they have some samples. They're like, oh, there's a little, there's a tiny bit of contribution. Most of the ancestry in modern Europeans dates to the last 10,000 years with farmers coming out of the Middle East and people coming out of the steppe. So the Ice Age ancestry, like the cave paintings that you see in Altamira and those places, those people only left a couple of percent of their genes in modern <laughs> Europeans. Modern Europeans are mostly the descendants of newcomers. That's yeah. I've never heard that. Why? Well, why? <laughs> why do you think that is? Well, I mean, um, well, I mean, how many Native Americans are there in the United States? Oh, I have no yeah, idea. Yeah, a couple of million, but no I'm just saying, like, it's proportionally, it's very small. So, hmm. like, there's no, there's no need. I mean, like, if you come with a better way, quote, way of life, you know. So and there is evidence. So there's two things. There's actually multiple waves, and I'm not gonna like confuse your listener too much but like there's an early wave low, no descendants there's a second wave some of the names you will have heard in um, books and science fiction or fantasy or whatever like gravitians magdalenians uh these people mm -hmm. mostly didn't leave much descent and uh, didn't leave much of their heritage anywhere but they did leave a little you know 20 30 thousand years ago and then after fifteen thousand years there was like a later wave i think like epi epi gravitian uh something like that they come out of like say like modern turkey southeast europe they're the primary hunter gatherers that were in Europe when the hunter gatherers came. And they left some of their genes, like maybe let's say like 10% in modern Europeans. But most of the ancestry mm -hmm. in Southern Europe is from farmers that came from Anatolia. Um, okay, where's Turkey? Where is that again? It's, that's Turkey. A, yeah. Turkey, right? yeah. So they're basically the, the farmers, the agriculturalists, right? And so they invented mm -hmm. agriculture. They like sailed in their ships to the Mediterranean. And they expanded all throughout Europe. And then later, about like four to five thousand years ago, these guys came in their carts from the steppe, from the Ukrainian steppe, Volga, the Volga region, called the Yamnaya, mm -hmm. and they overwhelmed a lot of the people in northern Europe and to a lesser extent southern Europe. So you know, like eighty to ninety percent of the ancestry in Europe dates to these two migrations, four to five thousand years ago, and about eight thousand years ago. Right, mm -hmm. and so very little of it is left from. Um, the cave people. And we know a lot about Europe because there's a lot of ancient DNA. There's a lot of archaeologists in Europe, et cetera, et cetera. Sure. But we can tell similar sure. stories of a lot of other places. Not always similar. Sometimes there's differences. The Chinese look to have a lot more continuity um, with the ancient times than in Europe. And I have some theories for why that is. But I want to ask you about China. But before we get there, let me just uh, hit close to home. So in terms of the Western Hemisphere, and indigenous tribes all up and down north central and south america there's like obviously like when people came to the new world and they're like we see like you know natives here in, in you know canada and the united states and then you have natives down in you know in the uh with the um the, the mayans and the incans and all that stuff like how did like they they had to come there at oh, some they've, point they've like always been did, here man so they've always been on the Western Hemisphere? Yeah, that's what the indigenous traditions say. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry, I'm just... <laughs> they, were born, they were born from uh, no, the No, it, it was the, the younger brother of Wolf, you know, but anyway. Uh... <laughs> <laughs> how did they get here? Yeah, so, how did they get oceans Yeah, so across? it's called... Um, so basically, um, during the Ice Age, I think it was like... Last, like, I'm going off memory here from grade school, but I think the sea levels at the peak of the last glacial maximum was 60 feet lower. And so um, there was a place called Beringia, which is basically a tundra savanna uh, between Alaska and eastern Siberia. And the Native American peoples, you know, we call aboriginals in Canada, indigenous, whatever. They, they were right. probably, um, they were, like we have ancient DNA. They were um, Siberian hunter-gatherers that stumbled onto Beringia, which was actually much richer 
um, the Northeast Siberia mm-hmm. or like Alaska to the, so they were stuck there. And it looks like they mm-hmm. show up around like 15 to 20,000 years ago. Their ancestry is about like two thirds, really, really anciently related. Like we're talking 20, 30,000 years ago uh, to people of Manchuria. The other mm-hmm. third is Paleo-Siberian, which doesn't exist in pure form in Siberia. And this Paleo-Siberian is actually very, very distantly related to the ancestry of European hunter-gatherers, about a third of their ancestry. And this Paleo-Siberian is actually found all over the world. It's found in India. Anyway, that's a whole different thing. Yeah, it's really complicated. Mm-hmm. But um, so, so, so the, the early Native American people, they themselves are a mix. Um, their Y chromosomes tend to have a lot of uh, haplogroup Q, which is Paleo-Siberian, and their mtDNA tends to be more East Asian. So... Um, they're, hmm. they're stuck up there, and then at some point, the ice opens up, and Beringia starts, mm-hmm. you know, it's, it's, this is like a Lannis thing, right? Like, they got to go somewhere, right? <laughs> and so they, they went, they went um, you know, into the New World, and um, it was a pretty empty New World. They expanded, massive demographic expansion. There was a few later, later migrations. Uh, the, the tool culture, um, some of the Eskimo, you know, Inuit groups, they came relatively recently, like, say, within the last you know, 5,000 years, I think, from Siberia. Um, and they have some contacts. And there's the Nadene people, the most famous of which are the Navajo speakers that are in the Northwest. And they seem to be connected to another relatively recent Siberian migration, say like 10,000 years ago. But that's, those are minor mm-hmm. contributions. So how about down in the in Central and that's South That's from America? the first Beringian, first American. And um, okay. yeah, so there's, there's not that much anything after the initial... Beringian wave. And so like, you know, they were in Beringia for thousands of years, just kind of pretty isolated uh, because they couldn't mm-hmm. go to the new world. And I mean, they could go back to like Siberia, but Siberia, <laughs> you know, why would you go back? So there wasn't that much like, you know, back migration. Huh. That's so interesting. So, okay. So, so tell me about China and well, I know you wrote a, was it a, yeah, you wrote a Substack piece, right? About well, that was um, Chinese history. Uh, Genghis Khan, right? And, 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 and did you write so I wrote this? about Genghis Khan uh-huh. and how, like, you know, 10% of the people in Central Asia are direct paternal descendants by Genghis Khan about 10 years ago. But it's a, for Discover Magazine, it's a really, really widely read piece. Yeah. It t- I've heard this a lot and I've read yeah. it, but just for listeners, you know, everyone should read it, but just give us the kind of summary of so, it, you know, like I've heard this yeah, a bunch so of times, you know. Basically, what happened in, um, you know, in 2003, a paper was published. Um, basically it showed that throughout much of central Eurasia, men have the exact same Y chromosome. The Y came, Y chromosome is passed, uh, uh, you know, from father to son. So, uh, something like 10% mm-hmm. of men in central, in inner Asia and central Asia have the same Y chromosome and it dates back a thousand years. And, um, the hypothesis is this is the Y chromosome of the Borgijin clan, clan of Temujin, Genghis mm-hmm. Khan. And one of the reasons why it's validated is it's really high frequency in Eastern Mongolia where the ruling families are all called all of the Kalka Mongols are all Borgijins. Um, they're, they're, they're Genghisized. They're descended from Genghis Khan. And it's also found in groups like the Hazar in, in uh, Afghanistan who are descended from, their legend is just they're descended from Mongols. Well, it turns out a third of their males have, you know, this haplotype. So until you dig up Genghis Khan's grave and check, you don't know for sure. But the people who claim they're descended from Genghis Khan have this. And then a lot of other people who have a history of like Mongolian legendary ancestry also have this. And um, it's also called, it's a star phylogeny, which means that it, um, it, it's, it, its evolutionary trajectory is such where it was at a low frequency for a long time, just like everything else. And then it exploded. So when something goes from like one, one to two copies to say like thousands of copies in 200 mm-hmm. years, um, you see a star phylogeny because um, everything is separated by one or two mutations because there haven't been enough time for a mutational structure to develop to create a tree right? When everything mm-hmm. just blows up like that. And so this is, there's other star phylogenies in the human genome, but this is one of them. And so the hypothesis is like, well, you know, Genghis Khan was known to have a huge harem. He's known to have a lot of sons. Like the only, the only yeah. children of Genghis Khan that we know are from his high status wives. Mm-hmm. But I mean, presumably there's like a lot of lower status wives that he had offspring with or his brothers, you know, like his brother Kasser, for example, is, uh, he is partly a progenitor of the, Ma- the Manchus of the Qing dynasty in China. Just, you know, so they're all over the place, these gangicides, right? Um, so the hypothesis is social selection for this prestigious paternal lineage resulted in a much higher frequency. And, um, you know, it, this is only through the paternal line, but this would also mean that there's a lot more segments of Genghis Khan floating around in the world, in the whole genome, 
I mean, not like 10%, mm-hmm. but like, you know, a non-trivial proportion. Um, and I know mm-hmm. researchers are looking into it of how to calculate it, how to infer it. And, you know, I've heard rumors, and this has not gone anywhere, that like they did actually discover the tomb of Genghis Khan in Mongolia, but they're not divulging it because they don't want people to like go there because he's like the national hero. I mean, yeah, he's a huge historical figure. I mean, he's, he's uh, got a very the big uh, history, you know, obviously. Yeah, the big statue. But I, yeah. mean, I mean, people should Google the, the Genghis Khan statue in Ulaanbaatar. It's this giant statue. Yeah, that's that's so wild, though, how like, I you know, the, the whole 10% thing is, is crazy. Um, okay, and then uh, real quick before we move on to one other thing. Um, this is, you know, you could talk about this for, for hours and whatever, but, you know, India. <laughs> India has uh, a lot yeah. of people, along with China, and but they have a lot of I don't know how you describe it. Uh, groups, population structure, population structure, yeah, yeah. cast. Oh, there you go, yeah, cast, yeah, yeah. Ex- explain that to us uh, a little bit. I know it, you, you can yeah. be here for hours explaining it, but no. So I mean, you know, there's this. India has like a lot of these castes, a lot of these ethno linguistic groups. Sometimes they're the same languages, and they don't intermarry, and all this stuff, and. You know, there was a theory that was really common 20 years ago that, you know, sociologists and historians were like, oh, well, the British created these categories and blah, blah, blah. Mm -hmm. They didn't really exist really well before that, but the British are very rationalistic and they segmented society. And then the geneticists look at the genes, they're like, damn, these are old. Like, you know, like there are Mm -hmm. like two people in the same village in India and there is genetically difference as a person from Finland and a person from Sicily. Yeah. Whoa, yeah, whoa, that's yeah, wild. and they looked. I mean, people, wow. they, people in these villages, they look different. Like they know, you know, that just by your face, you can tell. So they're very, very endogamous. There's a lot of inbreeding going on, and um, it's just mind blowing. You don't see it anywhere else in the world, really, to this extent. Like mm-hmm. there's a few. It'd be like, you know, like Jews in Europe were like endogamous and all that stuff, and it'd be like if there was like only Jews, but like all different types of Jews. You know, there's the Brahmin mm-hmm. Jews, there's the, you know, whatever Jews, there's all these different types of like groups that don't intermarry and that have their own way. And, and that's how it is. And so um, it's just kind of mind blowing. It's like very different than China, where it's like there's, it's all pretty straightforward. It's like there are people in the North are related to people in the North, people in the South are related to people in the South. You know, in India, um, less than 50% of the variation can be explained by regional variation. Whereas in Europe and China, most of it mm-hmm. can't. Where it's wow. like, you know, with just with, with like isolation by distance and genetic gene flow, it's just like, okay, the further you are away, the less likely you're to marry someone. But in India, it's not necessarily like that. You're not going to mm-hmm. marry the people from a different caste in your village. You would much prefer to marry mm-hmm. someone from a different village that's of the same caste, right? So um, mm-hmm. there's a lot of that structure going on. I mean, obviously, there's north south differences, but overlaid on this is this like really deep internal structure. Hmm. And that, so that's just been there. The, the British don't get no, to cre- take credit for that. One to two thousand years, maybe <laughs> older, but Indians themselves, like Europeans, are the product of the fusion of different groups. So one of their ancestral groups, uh, there's uh, let's do three different groups. There's three different stem groups. One one group is very like is distantly related to the indigenous people of the Andaman Islanders and just like dark skinned natives of Southeast Asia before the rice farmers came. Like so, that's one of their ancestral group. Um, so that's like that's like an aside. So there's like you know a lot of Indian ancestry is also from the West, mm-hmm. um, related to ancient people, Iranian farmers. And the third component, it's a small minority. It's like 15 percent of the overall ancestry, but as high as 30 percent in groups like Brahmins or in Pakistan, are basically these like you know chariot spear chuckers from the Eurasian steppe. Mm. You know what I'm saying? And so um, they're just basically like Bronze Age like warrior marauders that came down. And like you read the Vedas, the Rig Veda and stuff, like these guys were like fucking barbarians. You know? <laughs> I mean, they're just like they're fucking, med- you know, like they just like fuck shit up, you right. know. They they call them, you know, I mean, the Aryans. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. I mean, that's where the word comes from, like the free people, you know. Huh. And um, so like these groups fuse together, create this like huge like diverse tapestry, and mm-hmm. it's all politically controversial now. And, Whatever. It's interesting, though. When yeah. you look at the genetics, you're just like, damn, this, this is like complicated stuff. Like, this is going to keep me like working for a long time. <laughs> <laughs> India is one of those places that I'm just like, man, there is, I feel like I haven't even like, I haven't even opened like the first chapter of a book to try and understand Indian history and culture. Like, I know a few things, but it's just, it's vast. And it's, it's a lot of like, well, it's, a, it's, a, it's a whole, it's a whole, 
it's a whole continent, bro. Yeah. Like, that's one of the things. You, you put it on a map of Europe, it's like as big as Western Europe, bigger, you know? Mm-hmm. And so, you know, like China and India, for example, the United States even, it's like, I mean, these are really continents. Yeah. These are continent-sized nations. And so the United States doesn't have a deep history, so we're not as culturally diverse although we're racially diverse i wouldn't say we're actually as culturally diverse you know mm-hmm. like we're all speaking english you know in india they speak languages that are totally different sometimes the languages aren't even the same family yeah you yeah. know like the south indian languages have less genealogical relationship to the north indian languages than the north indian languages have to european languages because mm. the indo aryans you wow. know what i'm saying so wow. okay so <clears throat> i just want to ask about you know your opinion uh, you know, people are going to have different opinions about this. You know, obviously, more recently, uh, people have thought about race and ethnicity and all that stuff. And um, from you, as someone that's doing population genetics, you know, is it something where you're just looking at, um, you know, kind of the term, you know, population groups as opposed to, you know, race doesn't exist. And I don't, you know, we don't like that. We don't use that. Or how do you think about currently, you know, modern society about race, yeah. ethnicity, and, and groups and all that? Uh, what is, so people have a problem with the word race. And so I don't even use it anymore, but the, the, the issue is like, this is the argument that I have with geneticists because I'm, I'm way too frank in public because geneticists love lying to people because it just gets them <laughs> off our back. Um, I mean, be totally frank. Um, so yeah. yeah, I think you, you shouldn't communicate to people in a way where they take a different lesson from you than you are literally saying. What do you mean? So let's say that a geneticist says biology has disproven race. Mm-hmm. I can actually, I know exactly what they're saying there. Mm-hmm. Like humans don't really exist as subspecies. Like there's too much gene flow, blah, blah, blah. And also like all non-Africans are their own clade and Africa has, de- you know, all these things, right? Mm-hmm. But like what does like the, the lay person take away from that? Like they take away that like there's no structure. Right. It doesn't exist. It's not a real thing. But that's not what you're saying. <laughs> right and right. so like my question is like well why are you saying something where you know that people are not going to take well, i know why they're saying that because they want them off their back mm-hmm. right so um i like to be like honest and and accurate about these sort of things so you know i try to make it clear like you can use whatever word you want but basically what we're doing is we're like doing human evolutionary history and like these groups separated x thousands of years ago and remerged and you know, like if you give give me someone's genotype, I can tell you where they are, where they are pretty trivially. Mm-hmm. You know what I'm saying? Like if you give me a hundred hundred polymorphisms, I can tell you which continent with like ninety nine point nine percent certainty, right? Mm-hmm. If you give me like a thousand, I mean, I can tell you what subregion. If you give me a hundred thousand, you know, if you give me a whole genome, I can tell you their whole population history just from their one single genome because the genome is basically a collapsed pedigree, right? Like your genealogy, you know, you have two, you know, eight, you know, eight great grandparents, and then it just explodes out. And so from a genome, you could infer a lot of those things. Um, In any case, uh, my only point there is, uh, you know, what is accurate, what is precise, like, that's really important to me. I don't really care about the terminology. Um, You know, people don't like to use the word race now, because now it's got all these social connotations. So I guess that's fine. The only issue is like the social connotations of race, like do map on to some like straightforward reality, you know, like, my ancestors are from um, Eastern Eastern Bengal, from Bangladesh. Um, and so, you know, genetically, about like 20% of my ancestry is closer to East Asians, like Burmese. And mm-hmm. the other 80% is conventional subcontinental ancestry. I have about 15% steppe ancestry total. And the rest is a mix of uh, ancient indigenous South Asian and uh, Indus Valley civilization. My Y chromosome is R1, R1A, 1A, Z73, so I'm badass. You know what I'm saying? Like, those who need to know know exactly what that means my <laughs> mtdna is u2b u2b which is the same as the woman whose whole genome was sequenced from punjab from the indus valley civilization so i bring them both together bro you know oh, what i'm wow. saying yeah oh, that's mm. what i'm saying like i yeah. am like you're a uniter yeah i am the uniter not a <laughs> divider <laughs> i agree with you about the the how people look at um you know how people are interpreting things or how they're you know, people will, will say something in a certain way and then they'll take it another way. And so for you, you're fine with race. You're fine with saying you're this or you're that. You're fine with it. Or you, you're, or yeah, is it just the wrong language. I mean, for you, like, what is the language that makes sense? I, I think the old, the old terminologies were quite informative, even if like the, the, the problem with the old terminology is people were like, people are Platonists. Like they create these like 
discrete categories that are very idealized. So that's obviously false, but they're still quite informative um, and they're still useful in certain contexts. So, but I mean, they have a lot of baggage and, you know, in the woke age where like people are like hunting people for like thought deviation, I understand why you can't ever use it. But I mean, you know, old geneticists will still like defend the word, but they're old, they're going to die. You know, they're married, like, like Jerry Coyne. Mm-hmm. Jerry yeah. Coyne will defend the word race, but that's because he's emeritus. He's old. And he's a curmudgeon. Like yeah. young ones will not because, you know, yeah. they just go with the flow. Um, they're conformists. Most people are conformists, so they'll just go with the flow. But, uh, you know, I, population structure is real. But, you know, there are people out there who don't work in human population genetics and they don't know it. So they sincerely say that, oh, it's trivial. And I'm like, not trivial, you know? Mm-hmm. I mean, like, try to, try to, try to be like, um, like I, you know, I have some friends who are Finnish and like, like, dude, I mean, these people present as so fucking white. They wear a bandana in the summer. <laughs> like, they look like they look like a blonde. They look like a blonde gang, but it's because they have to wear a bandana because, like, otherwise they'll like fry, fry, like in the street. They're so pale. You know what I'm saying? But like, even there, right? Like, what does it mean to be Finnish? Like, how are they taking it? How are you? Like, how do people understand those things? Like, shouldn't we yeah, have yeah. certain yeah. like categorizations, like in that way? It depends. Different cultures have like different meanings. Like so, in Europe, it's much more racialized, especially in, like in Finland, it's like you know you speak, you, yeah, you know, speak a language, you, you eat certain food. You're Suomi, you, yeah, like you, you know. like you know blood sausage and tampere, but um, but also like you know you're white. I mean, they don't really, they they're not like America. They don't they don't see a non-white person that speaks Finnish as like the same. Mm-hmm. Maybe mm-hmm. they will someday, but they don't have. You know what I'm saying? Mm-hmm. Like yeah. you're a person of immigrant background. So. So then in that way, right, how about people like people make this distinction between race and ethnicity and all these things? Like, is that that's fine to do or it's inaccurate or right? Because then that, well, I, think, is, I, I think ethnicity is a little bit different because it's much more like explicitly cultural. Mm-hmm. Race has a biological background. Mm-hmm. So I think like they're on the they're on like you could you, ethnicity is also more fine grained. So ethnicity about history. Mm-hmm. You know, but again, ethnicity can be highly racialized. So, for example, um, you know, Chinese people, uh, if you're not, if you don't look Han Chinese, mm-hmm. like if you're just like learn Mandarin and you're, you know, get into like Chinese culture and you go to China and you're like, you know, I'm Chinese just like you, they'll be like, yay, you know, <laughs> like it's like they have like a, you no, look a certain way. <laughs> yeah, no, like you, you don't look like it, you know, right. so like they have a certain like preconception, but you know, it's not true in other, in other cultures. Like if you're in Brazil, like mm-hmm. you look Brazilian. Yeah. I mean, it's everything. I, I look Brazilian. Yeah. Yeah. Brazil is J- a is, Japanese person looks Brazilian. Right. Yeah, yeah. And so it's, it's, again, it's like conditional in America, you know, um, you know, like I probably like, was talking to a European guy once and I referred to myself offhand and, you know, because of my presentation, <laughs> not because of my identity, but as Western, you know, he laughed and I'm like, why'd you laugh? He's like, well, you know, you're not white, but you just said you're Western. This is funny to me. Mm-hmm. He wasn't meaning it, but it's just like in Europe, Western mm-hmm. person is a white person. Yeah. It's, it's really based on your ancestry in that continent. Whereas the United States, I think we're just much more chill about that because, I mean, black people are just as American as white people, if not more so in many cases. So, yeah. Yeah. How, you know, how, you can't really restrict the Western to just white people. Yeah, yeah. I, I guess the other thing is, um, this might be, a, again, a modern thing, but what about like mixed race or multi-ethnic kinds of people? Like, you know, how do you conceptualize that kind of stuff? Well, I mean, so, I'm mixed race. I mean... Everyone's mixed race. So you see it broadly that way, right? So well, I mean, like, like, you know, half of my ancestry is, is much more like people in the Western part of Eurasia. The other half is much more. So mixed race is like a cultural thing where it's like this generation, right? Yeah. yeah. But the reality is we are all mixed of like these different lineages. Mm-hmm. And so, again, there are no idealized types. There's just like distributions along a continuum. But, you know, there are certain peaks in that continuum. So you can say, like, you know, you have to give it a label, a population. You know, in population genetics, a population is like, okay, this is like a random mating group. Mm-hmm. Padmixia. That's, that's really the term. Mm-hmm. Whereas, like, you know, you have population structure because they're not all ran- – like, Chinese people are not randomly mating with Swedish people. Okay? So that's a technical term, but you know what I'm saying. Yeah. In yeah. terms of, like, you know, um, they're socially constructed, like, modal – uh, population profiles, and then they cross, and then it's, they're mixed race people, and then the mixed race people themselves create their own identity. So, you know, people in um, like Uyghurs are mixed East Eurasian, West Eurasian mm-hmm. within the last two thousand years. Yeah, well, but then now they're an ethnicity. Mm-hmm. You know, so that you know, ethnicities can be created, or like it, it, <clears throat> a lot of Latin Americans, like they consider those mestizo or whatever. 
Right. Again, that's that's like totally new. Mm-hmm. But new Within in terms last... of in terms of th- thousands of years, right? Well, I mean, it's like you know, three hundred years is still pretty. Yeah. Like if if it's historically recorded and you can see the ethnogenesis of the group, mm-hmm. like in the historical record, like that's pretty new. Mm-hmm. You know. Um. So I think mixed race people are pretty. Um. You know, there were ancestors of ours that were half Neanderthal. You think you think we're mixed? <laughs> oh, that guy's some, got some serious identity. Like they gotta like see a therapist. Like you know, you know, one day I want to be weaving, and then the next day I want to like go for some mammoth, and it's just like I'm separated between my uga and my booga. You know? <laughs> oh, it's funny. <laughs> so when I when I filled out the census this past or last year. Um, and I checked white as my race and Hispanic as my ethnicity. Was I incorrect when I did that? Or is he? You well, I can do what I want. I can do what truth? I want. What's your truth? <laughs> That's my truth. It felt true to me at the time. I was trying to be accurate, but you know, it just, it felt well, true. Well, I mean, look, I mean, like, you know, you present as a person of, of pallor, <laughs> of uh, the Caucasian pers- persuasion, right? So, I mean, <laughs> Like when you're in the streets, you're white. <laughs> I'm white. That's correct. Um, you know, people will say sometimes, "Yeah, you're white," but I can tell you got something else in you. You're not like, uh, but that's a hundred percent white is what I'll get. And I'm like, okay, cool. You know, whatever. I don't really care in some ways, but you know, there's that piece of it, right? Where sometimes people are always trying to put people in these boxes, and and for me, I just don't think anybody's really pure anything. Yeah, you know well, I mean, I mean? Well, a, a lot of that, a lot of that is people also will want to see it after the fact, mm-hmm. you know, because it's like, okay, now they have a narrative of you and now they want to like, kind of like, figure out, okay, well, I already, it was always like that. Like, I always knew, you know? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, but I mean, really, it's not, it's just, it, it's just like they want to create kind of a sketch of you that's not cognitively dissident, yeah. you know? A certain, oh. It's a certain script or schema that they need for like, okay, this is what this is, what this is and this makes sense. And it's a kind of, uh, I take it as a type of, it's something that we all do as humans, right? We're trying to do these mental discriminations. Okay, here, here, here. Yeah, here, yeah. Here, well, here, our, here. Facial, our facial recognition, our facial recognition, you know, we have a gestalt like facial recognition. We're really good at it. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, babies are very good at like racial discrimination and identification, even, you right. know, in toddlers, like this is well known, like you're just good at identifying people mm-hmm. um, by their phenotype. And that's just human nature. Right. Uh, now, one thing I do have to say is like, you know, the hunter gatherer world was probably not really racially diverse. So, you know, this was, this is actually just like, it's an out group of much more fine, much more fine grained genetic differences. Right. Yeah. Where it's like, you know, most of the most of the conflicts in the past would be between groups that look exactly the same. Mm-hmm. Right. Mm-hmm. So it's not we're not talking about like some ancient like racial context. That's not what I'm talking about. Most of the time you interact with people that look similar to you, but you look at like very little differences within the group or between the groups. And that's like very salient to you. So, of course, like we're just good at these, yeah. you know, phenotypic identification, you know, mm-hmm. um, and it depends on what your training set is. Um you were, I think you did a podcast with Ionia Atalia. Yeah, right? yeah, I did it recently. Yeah. She is half um, Parsi, which Parsi, is, yeah, yeah they're, they're genetically a Parsi is on average 75% Iranian, 25% Gujarati. Mm-hmm. So they're kind of like that. But, um, and she's got the Scottish thing in there too. So, yeah, yeah. And mm-hmm. she looks, I mean, if you look at a picture, like you just say she's white. But, um, she said, she said to me that, you know, Parsis will come up to her. And they know that she's part Parsi. Like they can see in her features mm-hmm. the Parsi aspects, but most people don't have a Parsi training set. Mm-hmm. Yeah, she so told me the not, same thing. Yeah, yeah, she, she, yeah. she was like, they, they know I'm one of them, but yeah. you know, because of the features. Right? Yeah, you can tell by the features. And it's, like, it's, it's only if you know. Like when I lived in uh, the Bay Area, um, like about like over ten years ago, I got to know a lot of people that were Tamil Brahmins. I years, uh, and uh, I don't know. Have I told you the story about the face? No, you haven't. I, I don't think you have. Okay, so, so yeah, so, um, so I'm in Florence, and there's a brown, there's like all these Chinese people, it's 2010 spring, all these Chinese people, I'm like, dude, it's just like we're in a city in China, you know, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. and like, um, it was by the Duomo, I think, and then like, then I see a brown person walking down, I'm like, oh, dude, this guy from India, my wife's like, or my girlfriend at the time, is like, oh, no, that's an American, I'm like, oh, how'd you know, and I was just like, look at the way he walks, and I was like, okay, so I walk up to the guy, uh-huh. and he's like turned around, like looking at the Duomo, and I'm like, tap him on the shoulder, and he turns around. Mm-hmm. And I'm like, hey, and he's like, hey, and so I'm like, okay, he's American. <laughs> and then he's like, 
Then I'm just like, are you a Nair? And he's just like, how'd you know? And I said, I pointed at him. And I said, your face. And I walked off. <laughs> now, my only point is there's a particular type of face associated with that subgroup. Right, right, that, right, that, right. That I had developed a training training set, like, you know, being in and around Silicon Valley, seeing South Indian Brahmin, you know, software guys. And like, he had that face, you know? Mm-hmm. So um, I wouldn't have been able to do that like two or three years earlier because I hadn't had the training set, you know? It's like, we're mm-hmm. just, we're good at queuing in at that information and recognizing people. Yeah, I think we do that. You know, people will have many, many uh, uh, negative things to say about that, right? It's like, oh, you know, it's this actual discrimination, it's racial discrimination. I think, no, I think, I think in general, in terms of mental discrimination of what we do as humans, we cert- we learn certain traits about uh, certain things in facial recognition to know, okay, this is this and this and this. Whether there's a value judgment placed on that or something else is a different story. But in terms of us making the distinctions um yeah i think we do all the time like you know i can i can tell when someone's from south america and someone's from central america again that's very loose whoa but whoa dude, loose. that's a, that's intense man i didn't know that <laughs> i thought they all looked the same i don't know man <laughs> yeah people 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 it's crazy you could do this with language too the spanish you know accents and stuff like that so i got i got a, a funny story about latin american diversity and how americans don't understand it um, once i was in uh, fort lauderdale and uh, I was at a coffee shop and this guy who's, uh, I was there for business. I was there for like, so I was at the coffee shop multiple days and I got to know this guy from Argentina. Mm-hmm. And, you know, I asked him like what his story was and he's like, oh, he's been here since high school and he's in college, blah, blah, blah. And, and we're just talking about Latin America and I'm like, oh yeah. And then he's like, and I was like, oh, people, you know, Argentina is not like, you know, most people here from Miami, there's Cuba, there's some Mexicans, there's, you know, Venezuela. Argentina is pretty far. He's like, yeah, I don't, there's not that many Argentines. So when he came to the United States, um, he was welcomed by his host family. I think he was in Georgia. Mm-hmm. They wanted to um, they wanted to make him feel welcome, so it was like a taste of home. Oh, so they no. ordered out from the Mexican restaurant. Oh my god! Oh my god! Oh, <laughs> and no. uh, he couldn't he he couldn't eat the spicy food because <laughs> his favorite food is steak yes. and um, and a Malbec. They, <laughs> yes and so they were like super confused like okay like how come we can eat this spicy food better than you because you're from latin america you oh know and this is, this is and presumably this was a more cosmopolitan family because they're hosting someone from argentina sure yeah you know but like mexico argentina are actually very far away and they're very different culturally <laughs> very different <I> mean, <laughs> but that was his illustration of like people in america they don't they don't know the difference yeah what is it 22 23 countries and in the modern era <laughs> Yeah, each place is so wildly different. Um, my my wife's from South America. My my dad and his family are, are from Central America, um, and so yeah, I mean, there's similarities for sure. Um, you know, we all like the big folks in you know you know Celia Cruz and Juan Luis Guerra and all these guys. You know, for music, or we like similar types of foods, and we speak the same language, and then that's about it. And then it just like diverges from there. It's just like very very different. Um, so. Well, so uh, another story about that. Um, so I had a friend from Guatemala, mm-hmm. and uh, anyway, I think he was in Detroit. Was he was in Honduras, mm-hmm. and um, you know, he was like, "Oh, well, like, let me let me let me cook dinner or something like that." He's just like, "Where are your tortillas?" <laughs> and um, people in Honduras were like, "We don't eat tortillas here," and they were like, "He was like, what?" And so he had not realized that the tortilla belt ends in Guatemala. It's like Mexico, Guatemala. Mm-hmm. It doesn't go further south, you know? El Salvador does was, it. We, we do it a little bit. We do it okay, a little bit. Okay, okay. Yeah. But not Honduras, apparently. Yeah, well, Honduras is an interesting place, at least, you know, because they they have the, the I guess it's the Caribbean on the, uh, on the east side of them. And so they have a lot of, um, I think they had more of the slave trade and they have more mixing there. And so, you know, Guatemala and El Salvador are on the other side. So they're kind of a little more similar. So there's some things that get, you know, mixed in with what they do and what they don't do. For example, in South America, they don't eat tortillas, right? They yeah. eat rice. Which is good, remember, man. Which is good. It's like weird. I, I remember when the first time I went to South America, I was just like, why do you guys eat rice like three times a day? This is so weird. It's like Latin people eating rice all the time. Why not? I mean, it's fine. But it's just not. I was like, where's the tortillas? <laughs> So it's just, yeah, Latin America is a very wild place, super diverse. 
Okay, Razib, I want to be mindful of your time. I know you're a busy guy. Tell everybody where they can find you, where they can subscribe to all your stuff, where can yeah. they listen to you? Yeah, so um, I got like a bunch of different websites, but um, so the two primary ones, razib.substack.com. I have a Substack there. I've um, got some premium comment content, but like sign up, give me your email so that I get, get your mailing list. Um, also, if you go to razib.com, um, you will see my various blogs, a blog called Gene Expression, a blog called Brown Pundits. I have a podcast for Brown Pundits. I have some other podcasts of, that I used to do um, from Evolution and Genetics. You can see all of it, like places that I write um, on Twitter, uh, twitter.com backslash Razib Khan, you know, unless I'm suspended or something. <laughs> but um, yeah, but if you go to Razib.com, you'll find it at all. But really, uh, just go check out my Substack. I'm just trying to get as many emails and just get, you know, captured audience there because, you know, that way, like I have you forever. <laughs> yeah yeah go to his Substack. it's great he writes really awesome stuff uh he's fun on twitter um Razib, thanks for for coming on and, and giving us all your information man you're you're bright and funny and i love it my pleasure man all right man thanks